Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Good Stuff. I'm Kevin Billy, and as always, we appreciate you joining us. Well, hey, football is in the air. Uh, it seems like at every level and every day, and who better to join us right now than legendary football coach Bob Shipley. Bob, it's great to have you. Hey, Coach. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure for me to be with you this morning. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I mean, being an Ohio guy, I got to jump right into it. I'm, I'm, uh, my wife and I love Coach Taylor off Friday Night Lights, so we know a little bit about Texas football, right? But I, I want you to tell me why it's different or just maybe what it is that's different about it. You know, it's just it just seems to be ingrained in the culture. Um, you know, I spent 27 years coaching high school football in Texas and um, coached in some some really good places that uh, where it seemed like every kid in the community – from the time they, uh, you know, were aware of what was going on, wanted to grow up and be a Brownwood Lion or a Temple mm-hmm. Wildcat or a Burnett Bulldog or, you know, wh- wherever. Uh, it's just almost like a rite of passage here, you know, in this state. And um, thankfully, the school boards and the school districts uh, understand uh, the importance mm-hmm. of athletics and the lessons that are learned and the life skills that can that can happen, uh, not, not really on the field of competition as much as just, you know, going through all the things that, that you have to, to put in to be a good teammate and represent your school with class and character and all that. So they, they put, um, uh, you know, some emphasis on those things and giving our kids good facilities and uh, good community support. And, uh, you know, I've coached in some places where, uh, people get up in the morning and read the obituary to see if a season ticket holder died at the local <laughs> high school football stadium so they could, you know, get some season tickets because they're not available. They pass them down through wheels, you know, in some, wow. some town. So it's just a, a really cool place to, to grow up, I think, uh, you know, for somebody that, that likes, uh, you know, football. And it's just a really big deal. Sometimes, uh, you know, they'll bring elementary kids to the pep rallies, you know, and, and the pep rallies are, are unbelievable. I mean, they just – they blow the top off the roof and there's just a lot of spirit and a lot of pride. And it's just, it's really important to our culture to, you know, everybody seems to live vicariously through the football team. And so a lot of people will determine what town they're going to move to based on, you know, if that town is a winner. Yeah. Know? Right. 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 Uh, well, so. yeah, I, I, I go, I, I, I know a little bit about this being uh, Maslin and McKinley, not too far away. Right. The pro football Hall of fame, but sure. I, I really want to, I want to, I want to stop right there with something you said that, I, I'm unbelievably biased to, and maybe some listening are and some aren't, but talk to us a little bit about some of those life lessons, because I feel like every day of my life, something in my athletic background as a player, as a coach, there's something embedded in there, you know, whether it's the resilience, the perseverance, the work ethic, the attitude, the teamwork, you know, whatever it might be, what, what sticks out to you is a couple of life lessons that you do learn through athletics that you mentioned. Well, I, I have a couple of different perspectives on that. One, one is the fact that, um, in in my in my opinion, and that's not everybody agrees with me, but I kind of feel like life is a competition. Mm-hmm. Okay, for, for example, I, I tell the high school kids, you're competing for class rank, you're competing for scholarships, academic, athletic, you know, whatever. Um, you're competing for entrance into a university. You're competing uh, for um, maybe, hopefully, a, a girl's hand in marriage. You know, you're gonna, hopefully you're not the only person that, you know, <laughs> thinks it's a, a marriage worthy woman or whatever. And so then you're gonna be competing for people uh, applying for jobs. You're gonna be competing for promotions. You're gonna be competing for uh, getting bids on, on jobs for your company, What whatever, you know, you go into life is a competition. Okay. And so, and, and ultimately I feel like, um, good and evil, you know, God and Satan, there's a competition for your soul, in, you know, in my, in my opinion. And so, and so life is a competition. You have to learn how to compete. And when you learn how to compete, you've got to learn how to overcome adversity because we've all fallen, we've all failed. And so, um, you know, try, try and not to to let that be a weight on you. Instead, let it be uh, something that you learn from. And uh, so I think uh, well, one of the greatest lessons that coaches teach is overcoming adversity because yes. it's coming. You just better buckle up. It's coming. 
and the key to your success in life as a person, as a father, as an employee, as a Christian, as, as whatever, is how you respond to it. Yeah, it's really, really good. I, I'm not going to get this quote right off the top of my head, but I, it reminded me the one time when Saban said something like, you know, high level people don't like mediocre people, mediocre people don't like high level people. Right. And so you're, you're in a, you're in a small group. And actually um, I, I'd be anxious to know too. I mean, you've coached uh, a, a lot of players over the years. Um, wh- what do you notice about the best ones? If somebody's listening and, you know, and there's something they even want to make applicable in their life, is there a consistency to what stood out to you over that time? Yeah, I don't think that there's any question about it. And it's pretty easy. Uh, you know, there's obviously not one blueprint, uh, but um, the guys that I, I think, I think this, uh, there are guys that, that just play to the level of competition. And mm-hmm. so that's all that, that's, that's their, their ceiling in terms of their thoughts. And so they train to be maybe a starter on their team, or they train to be, you know, um, the, the best, best player in their district or whatever, but the really great ones, the really great ones, uh, they train at a different level because they see their vision is much, uh, much higher than just trying to earn a spot on a team or trying to be all district or trying to be whatever they train at a whole different level and they understand that everything matters. And so, um, you know, I, I tell, I tell people this, you know, what's your goal? What's your goal as an athlete? Okay. Mm -hmm. Tell me what your goal is. All right. So they tell me what their goal is. And then now does your work ethic and your attitude match your goal? Uh, If it doesn't, you don't have a goal. You have a wish or a dream. So trying to get kids to, to raise the, the ceiling of what they think they're capable of doing. And then trying to make sure that they, that their work ethic and their attitude matches that the great ones do the great ones do. They give the same effort. First down, fourth yeah. down, first play of the game, last play of the game, ball to their side of the field, ball away. It doesn't matter. They give the same effort every time because it's in their DNA, you know, to be great. And I'm not so worried about somebody's athletic ability. I always say, I want I want to help you reach your DNA potential. In other words, you're not going to be the fastest. You're not going to be whatever. But if I can help you be reach the potential that your DNA will allow you to, to be, that's, that's, that's the goal for every, for every athlete. And those great ones, as we're talking about, uh, th- they stand out because everything matters. They don't take days off. They don't take plays off. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're driven internally to be the best. And it's a pleasure when you get some guys like that. And the fun thing, Kevin, as you know, when you get a couple of guys like that, they raise a the level of everybody on the oh, team. Yeah, for sure. Everybody on the team. Oh, okay. That that's how it's done. And um, they're, they're just a pleasure to coach. They make us look good as coaches a lot of times. Yeah, boy, don't. That's what I always used to say. I said, you know, if you guys make shots, I'll be a good coach. And if you don't make shots, your parents will think I'm a bad coach. So, but they, they, <laughs> that's a lot they, of truth. All of that was really, really good. I love the part about the internal because it's, you know, the, the ones I feel like it's just more and more kids lack that intrinsic motivation. You know, they need <laughs> extrinsic. And so, that that's something that I've paid attention to. It seems like more and more. Now you mentioned coaching 27 years of high school to 10 years in, in, in college. So you spanned over 37 years. What, what would you say were the biggest changes? And maybe we could probably do an entire podcast on this. I'm, I'm, I'm just assuming, but what were the biggest changes from the beginning to the end? Like, is there things that stuck out to you or maybe one significant thing in that time? The, 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 the thing that I love uh, about, um, I've never been a, a stay between the lines kind of guy, you know, uh, have boundaries. I, I grew up in a, in a traditional offense in high school. We ran the straight T uh, we had one pass play. I mean, it was, it was just three, three, three yards in a cloud of dust. If you're lucky to get that much, everybody knew what you were doing. I went from, from that to Abilene Christian and we had an innovative uh, coach there, Ted Sitton. Uh, who threw the ball. Uh, we had uh, a lot of great quarterbacks through that system. Uh, Jim Lindsay, Clint Longley, who played for the Cowboys, and uh, a lot of great quarterbacks through that system. And that was in the 70s when not many people were throwing the ball. You know, mm-hmm. BYU maybe. In fact, that's where he got his offense from, I think, was BYU back in the day. So I went from that from that most boring high school offense you've ever, you can ever imagine, no imagination at all, mm-hmm. to being in an offense where we were throwing it you know, 50, 60% of the time. 
And so that just blew my mind. Uh, and so, um, so as I, as, as my career progressed and the game progressed, uh, I got to know a guy named Art Browse <clears throat> and Art Browse was, uh, in my opinion, uh, the, the greatest Texas high school football coach. He did, uh, he took a town, he didn't go to a town where they were winning state championships every year. He didn't go to it. They weren't even winning district championships every year. They were the average average. Uh, when you saw Stephenville Yellow Jackets on your schedule, it was just another game. You know, uh, there was nothing about the tradition of that place that made them special until he got there. Mm -hmm. And he got those kids to believe. He's an incredible motivator. And then he was an option guy. And so he just like, said, okay, there are, there are no rules. There are no boundaries. What can we do with this? Okay. Well, let's make, let's make an option. Uh, let, let's spread people out and give an op, give the quarterback an option to give the ball or keep it. If the end crashes down, you know, it's, it's, it's the, the zone read. He's the first person he was doing it back, you know, way before anybody else was doing zone read. Uh, he was doing it and it blew my mind when I was talking to him and I said, how does that quarterback know when to give the ball to the back? Or how does he know when to keep it? Because every time, uh, I, no, I, I said, I said, what do you call that play where the quarterback keeps it? Because it works every time. And he goes, it's the same play. And I said, what? He said, it's the same play. And it just blew my mind that, okay, so you're in the shotgun spread offense and you're still using option concepts. If the defensive end chases that tackle that's pulling on the, on the, uh, the, the counter, then uh, chased in the back, then the quarterback keeps it. And so that just opened, opened a whole new world to me. And so uh, I always uh, told our staff, look, don't, don't get caught up and this is just the way we've always done it. Be innovative, be creative. Yeah. And so it was so much fun in, in the early to mid 2000s here in Texas running the spread in high school when not many people did. We were fortunate enough to have a great quarterback named Stephen McGee who played for Texas A&M and then, then with the Cowboys. Um, who, who ran it to perfection. And we had some, some great kids with him and people didn't know how to defend it. And it was, it was uh, an awful lot of fun. So, so I feel blessed that I, that I was a, a, a high school coach yeah. in Texas in the time of transition where all of a sudden, you know, uh, well, it's, it's just like the things that, that come from Texas tech down, down yeah. here, they yeah. have great offense, you know, um, for a while there, everybody wanted a coach from the air raid offense, mm -hmm. you know, and so people like creativity and innovation. And, and I just love the fact that, that the sky's the limit with what you can do offensively in, in football and it puts defense in a, in a bind. But uh, that's been the funnest thing, uh, thing that I look back over my career and, and thankful that I was uh, able to, to, uh, to learn things like that. Right. Yeah, for sure. Well, two things come to my mind right away, Bob. It's number one, the, the fact that they throw so much makes my three boys – uh, 14, 12, and six. And so with my brother and his kids, we just have a fun fantasy league. So they're happy their quarterback gets a lot of points, right? But I, I want to I wanna just make sure people also heard something in there that I think is really crucial because I remember, you know, just a personal story playing man-to-man -man defense for so many years. Uh, I don't know, four or five years maybe. Uh, and then eventually trying, you know, something different because where we were at and how we had to recruit and went in zone, which was totally against the grain and against your pride. But it was, it well, was really good. If you run zone, you're lazy, right? Yeah, right. Only the great coaches run man to man. That's what I always heard. Yeah. The lazy ones run the zone. <laughs> but that's the thing is it's like, I, I think what, what made me, made me think of that personal story right away is sometimes you just, you just have to have the guts, if you will, to do something that, and, and then have a conviction in it and go with it. And I don't think some coaches are willing to do that. You know, they're willing just to, you know, we had Kevin Kelly on here at one point, I'm sure, you know, the coach who never punts, you know, and now he's at college and, and I just got a great deal of respect for the people that have that conviction in their belief doesn't always work, but I, I think that's something for leaders to pay attention to and what you're alluding to there. Um, what advice I'd be curious to know, though, before we jump in a little bit of Texas, what advice would you give any young coach right now? Or if you had to go back and talk to 25 year old Bob Shipley? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I've learned so much and most of it I learned the hard way, mm -hmm. but uh, I had great mentors, you know, and um, I I think that uh, being, being the best that you can be at the level that you're at and, and not always looking ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of, it seems like a lot of young coaches, they want to fast track to be a coach and they don't understand how hard it is. 
all the other things that go on that uh, they just kind of blow off and think, oh, I'll, I'll take care of that. I just, you know, I'm going to be, you know, this, that, whatever. But the most difficult thing is to be present in the moment where you are. I had a guy one time who was a freshman uh, offensive line coach, and uh, he had been with me three years. And he came in and he said, hey, uh, coach, uh, you've got an uh, assistant line job open up on varsity. Uh, I'd like to be considered for that. And I said, okay, um, let, let's look at the your body of work. So in my opinion, your players, when I watch your players on tape, they tell me what kind of coach you are. I'm not talking about athletic ability. I'm not talking about quickness. I'm not talking about, you know, go up and moss somebody. I'm talking about fundamentally, are your kids sound? Do they go hard every play? Uh, what's their technique? And so – you know, I said, let's let's look at your freshman film. Oh, well, those those kids are hooligan. You know, they're those kids are knuckleheads. You can't teach. You know, I just you know, I think when I get to the varsity where kids are serious about it, I said, hang on just a second. That's not the way it works. You are the head coach of the offensive line on the freshman team. OK, their body of work represents you and tells me what kind of coach you are. So don't tell me one day when you're under the big lights, then you'll start being serious right. about making right. the kids the best you can be. And so uh, I found myself as a young coach looking ahead, looking ahead instead of being present and be that, uh, you know, that freshman assistant coach and be the very best freshman assistant coach that I could be. That's great. Yeah, that's really, really good. It, I, I remember when I was young, somebody told me that just the job that you have now is the best one. You know, don't worry about the job that you don't have. But being present to your point, you know, we, we the question was what was best you know, advice for younger coaches. I think that's great for anybody in life. You know, you worked for, you, you talked about mentors and then of course you work for Mac Brown, you work for Tom Herman. You, you've been around some really good leaders. Uh, I know they're, those are coaches, but just leaders in general. What, what do you think the best leaders exemplify in their role? Uh, I tell you what, uh, you know, Mac and Tom both have uh, uh, different qualities and, and they both have their strengths. The, the one thing that I love that I learned from, from Mac Brown was uh, he, he brought everybody in the whole, anybody that had anything to do with football, he brought them in and, and we had a meeting custodians, secretaries, wow. equipment guys, academic tutors, anybody that had anything to do with football, the field crew, he brought, he brought them in. And so he said, we want to be a championship football team, right? You want to be a champion? Yeah. Okay. Mario, you're the custodian. That was his name. You, you be the best custodian in the country. Love be it. the best in the country. And so brought the secretary in. You be the you want to be a you want to be a national champion? Yes, sir. You be the best secretary in the freaking country. You know, be the best. And he went and the ground crew, do you guys want to be national champions? Have the best field. I mean, take better care of your field than any. So he went through it and just got everybody and and he built that culture. You know, that, hey, we're all in this together. We're a team. And if every one of us have the goal to be the best in the country, we can't fail. You know, at least at least we'll reach our potential. And so that that really um, that really resonated with me uh, for obvious reasons. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. I mean, you don't have any uh, by chance, any good Matthew McConaughey stories, do you? <laughs> No, well, I tell you, I, uh, I I get to hang out with him once in a while, and uh, I, I I don't have any any that I could tell. I I, I tell you what, there, there's one there's one movie he did called Bernie. I don't know if you ever saw that, but no, that, that, I haven't. That's a that's a true story. You ought to you, you ought to watch it. It's a true story about a guy who was a funeral director uh, in Carthage, Texas, and um, he 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 winds up he winds up killing a lady. Uh, he's, he's very effeminate, really. I mean, he's, he's just a, a, a sings at the funerals and just such a loving, caring guy, but this lady kind of takes him under her wing and she, she, uh, she, she gets him to the point where he just like can't take it anymore, but he played the prosecutor, uh, in that movie. And I asked him about that and he's from Longview, Texas, which is not from Carthage. And he said, yeah, man, I remember the story. It's a real life story. Everything. In fact, Matthew's mother was in, was in the movie. And um, anyway, it's 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 a really good movie. It's got Jack Black in it. Jack Black oh, wow. actually plays plays the guy. But uh, it's interesting hearing him talk about a story that he had heard of because he grew up right in that area. 
and then got to play in it. But uh, anyway, we talked about uh, Dallas Buyers Club and how he how he lost so much weight for that, and he told me how he did it, uh, which I wasn't interested in, in yeah. doing what he had to do yeah, to lose right, that right, weight. Right. But, but he's no. uh, he, he's a, he's an incredibly wise person. I mean, you know, you, yeah. you see him as the actor, but when you hang out with him, he knows football. He knows a lot of football. Oh my goodness, yeah, yeah he's. Yeah, but he's he's fun to hang out with sometimes. Well, that's good. Yeah, I, I, I've I've grown to respect him a little bit more here, especially in the last couple of years. Love his new book. You know, one, one thing, Bob, that, that I'd love to hear about from you um, is is what it's like or what it was like to coach your sons and then some best advice for fathers out there, because. You know, I'm in 12U baseball right now. Um, I'm going to be, you know, in some 6U stuff next year with our youngest. Bob, I see some crazy stuff out there. Uh, yeah. And I'm sure that resonates with you. But you've been through it. Your sons were successful. They're still successful. Uh, we're going to dive into family and faith after this. But give us something that if they're, if I'm a dad listening right now, you know, I, I can execute what you're about to say. Well, um, when I was, uh, I was coaching at Abilene Christian University when my oldest son, Jordan, was to the age to start playing youth football. And um, I, uh, we went over and watched the game one day, and I just I saw this dad that was screaming his head off. I mean, just un- out of control at the kids. And as I got to listen to him, I realized that he was yelling at all the kids to block for his son, who oh, was boy. the quarterback, who almost ran it every down. And so it was daddy ball. You know, so I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm coaching college ball. I can't coach my son's youth football team. I don't want him to start off and have a bad experience. So my oldest son, Jordan, who who was very successful, incredible uh, career in high school. He became the the uh, the all time leader in Texas high school football for career receptions, career touchdowns and um, career yardage as a receiver. Uh, the best, I mean, the, every level he, he did it. Um, and, and the thing, the thing about that is he never played football until he was in the seventh grade, mm. never played football, didn't play flag football, didn't play anything. They didn't really have flag, flag football back then. But my, my point is that you don't have to start a kid when he's in the third grade playing full contact tackle football. You, you don't, you know, and, uh, Make sure your kids have a good experience. If they don't enjoy it, I mean, I promise you, when I was in third grade, if I had all that equipment on and it was 100 degrees outside and I had a coach who was screaming and yelling at me, making me run laps, no, I'm I'm sorry. Right, I, right. Football's not for me, you know? And yep. and anyway, uh, but the most important thing is for your kids to have fun. Yeah. If, if they don't have fun and enjoy, let them be them. Don't try to live your mm-hmm. life through them. Uh, let, let them have fun because, uh, when it's all, you know, when it's all said and done, um, people will forget what you did. They'll remember who you are. So parents that want to make their, you know, make their kid, uh, successful somehow in football to get a scholarship or whatever, all that stuff fades, you know, you, you're still going to have a relationship with your kid the rest of the life, the rest of your life. So, um, I think it's very important to teach your kids don't let football or any sport define who you are as a person yeah. because when all that's over with, you're stuck with who you are. And so uh, I've seen it ruin relationships with father and sons. And I've seen it. Uh, I've seen it unbelievable where a, a incredibly successful head coach, uh, his son is on the, the high school robotics team. Yeah. He doesn't yeah. care about football. So yeah. what you're my son. I love you. I care about you. Uh, I just, I just want you to be the best person, the best father, the best husband, the best, whatever. And if, if your interests aren't what my interests are, that's okay. I right. love you anyway, you know, that's right. and, and I, I, I really admire people like that. I really do. Yeah, that's good stuff. I, 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 to reiterate two of the things you said, that's in that what drives winning book, you know, who you are over what you do. There's so many people. I just seen something recently on Michael Phelps, you know, when he came out of that pool after all those years, he didn't identify with who he was, you know, he's having some of these mental struggles because he spent more of his life in that pool. Right. And that became who he was. And somebody told me the same thing when I was coaching, like, Hey, you, you might coach him for three years, but you'll be their dad forever. You know, and that's, Great that's point. so, that's yeah. so important, important. So it, it, it obviously seems to, to me um, that, that faith and, and family are top priorities for you, which, which I have the utmost respect for. What are some things that you're doing in your life, Bob, to make sure those things stay there? 
Well, um, un unfortunately, in my life over the last uh, year, I've had to overcome some adversity. And so um, in, in my personal life. And so um, one, one of the things that I realized is for years I taught kids, my kids and the kids I coached, the most important thing is your attitude and how you overcome adversity. Then I, I, I was hit with some of the worst adversity I could have ever imagined in my life happening. And uh, I knew this. I knew my kids were watching everything. Any way I responded, they were watching. And so all these things dad said all these years, we're going to see if it was just talk mm. or if it was real, you know. And so the most horrible things can happen to you in your life. But if you don't have if you don't have that faith and you don't have the foundation to be the same person in the good as you are in the bad, when things are going good and when things aren't going good, you're the same person. And, uh, you know, you God loves us unconditionally. And I have to trust him unconditionally that he's going to see us through any storms that come our way. And so, you know, it's the old, it's the old saying, I'd rather see a sermon lived than preached any, any day. And so uh, no matter who you are, I don't, I don't care if you're a, a grown man or you're a backup center on an eighth grade team, somebody's looking up to you, somebody's watching you, somebody's looking up to you and, and you're living a sermon. And so um, I think that's probably the most Im important thing to me is uh, people are always watching how you respond to uh, what life throws at you. And if you're not grounded in your faith, uh, it could really throw you for a loop. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Thank you for sharing. I, I think a lot of this and what we're talking about, uh, I'm, I'm going to inject the the Twitter account of one of my favorite followers, or, or I'm one of your favorite followers. Let's put it that way. I absolutely I love uh, what you're doing on Twitter, Bob. It's the best. What, walk us through that a little bit in terms of, you know, your process of these posts. Well, um, I've always, um, I've always been a guy who loves motivation, who loves thought provoking uh, things that make you stop and think and, or maybe hit you right between the eyes or whatever. Uh, my father introduced me to uh, a book written by a man when I was in uh, uh, a young uh, named Zig Ziglar. And mm -hmm. he was the first one I, you know, Andrew Carnegie, Zig Ziglar, you know. And so I remember reading that and thinking, you know, I mean, that fired me up, you know. And so, yeah. so I, I've always tried to, when I hear something or I think of something that uh, I think maybe can help me, uh, first of all, it has to resonate with me. If it doesn't resonate with me, then I'm not, you know, I'm not a kind of guy that throws stuff out there to preach yeah. to other people. It has to resonate with me and probably hit me between the eyes. But when I came to uh, to Texas, uh, I wasn't on Twitter or anything. And, and, and Mac Brown said, coach, you need to get on Twitter and, uh, you know, recruits and, you know, high school coaches and things like that. And, uh, you know, follow the people we're recruiting and, you know, just, you know, do, do you have a lot of good things to say? So, you know, put, put it out there. And so um, so I started doing that back then. And then when when Mac left Texas um, in 2000. Well, basically, I guess it was December, January 2014. Um, that spring, I worked for Charlie Strong for uh, a few months and then decided I wanted to get back into high school coaching. And so I, I, I took an athletic director and head football job at a 6A school in Texas. And, and my first day on the job, I decided, OK, I hadn't been doing it up to that point. But I thought every day, six days a week, I'm going to put something out on Twitter that if it doesn't mean anything to anybody else, it, it meant something to me somewhere in my life. Mm -hmm. And I learned something from this. And then, and then on Sunday, I'm, I'm going to try to put something spiritual, spiritual on their Sunday, but the rest of the week. And, and so I just started doing it every day. So I started going back and finding all these things I'd written down, all the things that I'd heard coaches uh, say to the players, things that I would told my players. And, and there's nothing really new about anything I put on Twitter. It's just, I may say it a different way, but it, right. it's, it's things that we've all heard at some point in time, but you're like, oh yeah, man, yep, that's, yep. yeah. And so I also found that uh, then when I came back to Texas with Tom Herman five years ago, I saw that uh, there was an opportunity for me. I couldn't, I couldn't put everything on Twitter. I was thinking because I didn't want parents to think that I was my parents of my players. Yeah. I didn't want them to think I was talking about them or their son. But when I came back to Texas, I started kind of in your face stuff a little bit more 
so that high school coaches could say, okay, look, I've been, how long have I been telling, I've been telling you this same thing for years now. You're not listening to me. You know, here's a guy at the university of Texas. He's saying the same thing or, or maybe, you know, maybe a, a mom or dad, you know, who's trying to motivate their child or whatever, you know, they, they looked at that and say, Hey, look, look at this. See, I'm not the only one that tells you this. So, uh, and it's just kind of grown and it's grown and it's grown and it's become, it's, it's to the point. Sorry about that. That's all right. It's to the point that I've kind of created a monster because uh, it's hard to stay fresh. <laughs> some days I don't want to. So some days I'll just, uh, I spend a lot of time driving on the road. Now I do ranch real estate with my boys, uh, not full time, but I do it a lot. And so I'm on the road a lot. You know, the ranches in Texas are big. And so you you have a lot of time to think. Yeah. And so I, I'll, sometimes I'll, I'll write four or five of them down in one day and just use them, you know, when, when I need them. But, uh, it's been a blessing and, and I've, I get a lot of feedback from it. And, and it's also allowed me to follow some great people out there on Twitter too, who are, sure. who are, who are doing the same thing. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's all, it's all about encouraging people to be their best. And yeah. if it resonates with them, fine. If it offends them, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't ever put anything out there to offend anybody, but uh, you know, just try to help people. And, and now that I'm, I'm out of coaching, I just want to be an encourager and I want to, I want to, be a resource for people, uh, maybe not make some of the same mistakes I made right, as a right. coach. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love it. I, I think it's real authentic. And um, at the end of the day, I mean, the, the people are offended or probably afraid of it's, it's almost a calling out of sorts. I'll read some of those sometimes and I'm like, dang it, man, I, I need to, I need to work on that or focus on that. Um, you, you just alluded to, we'll, we'll wrap up here and get into to three pointers. Tell us a little bit about retirement. You alluded to a little bit of what you're doing here and then, um, you know, maybe one or two questions and we'll, we'll get into that. Well, uh, I had decided that, uh, well, I was actually going to retire before Tom Herman, uh, came and, uh, and I'd got my real estate license. My, my older son, Jordan was, was doing uh, ranch real estate. And, and then Tom, uh, called when he got the job, say, I need you. Uh, and, you know, your connection with high school coaches in Texas and all those things. And so, I, so I came to work uh, with him and then um, I, I told him before the end of this past season that I was going to retire at the end of the season, um, at the end of December. And then unfortunately for him, things didn't work out for him to stay. And so when coach Sark came in, he called me and I said, Hey, I hear you're retiring. And I said, yes. And he said, well, can you, uh, can you at least help me find, you know, the replacement and kind of guide me through, help us through some of the things that you were doing. And so I, I stayed on and helped him through spring ball. Uh, and then, then I retired and, uh, it's been uh, really kind of strange now that football season uh, is underway. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just being a, a fan, you know? Right. And, uh, yeah, but, but I love it. My, my boys, uh, I had such a special relationship with my boys. They were on a bus with me, uh, when they were little bitty guys and by our ball boy and the sidelines. And then, you know, so we, we've, we've shared a lot of great things together. We've shared some heartbreaks together, but for me to, I don't guess necessarily see them every day, but I talk to them every day. And, uh, I have eight grandkids now, which wow. was another big, uh, yeah, the oldest one is five. So Jeez. Christmases are going to get real expensive around my house pretty quick, but, uh, but I love them. I'm fixing to have number nine. My daughter, the youngest daughter is going to have one next month, Lord willing. But um, so, so there's just, everything to me is about family, you know, and yeah. I, I've, I've done, um, you know, I've done the coaching thing and I've done the college thing and, and all that stuff. And, and now I just want to be with my family yep. and I, yeah, I just want to enjoy, enjoy things and, and just encourage and help people uh, as much as I can. And, and so I get, uh, I get, I, I get a, a, a great sense of accomplishment by, by just, uh, just trying to be there for people, you know, right. it's, just, it's just, just good to give, give back for a while. For sure. For sure. Are, are you much of a reader coach or what are some ways that you're growing? And, and if you are a reader, you know, we always love to throw out a couple of good books too, if people haven't read them. You know, uh, I, I don't read a lot, but you know, McConaughey's book is, is, yeah. is really good. I, I'm telling you, the guy has got a lot of common sense. He's a very wise person and he's very level, level headed, but, uh, you know, um, 
Have you ever read the book, uh, make up, make up your bed, make your bed? No, you know, I I've seen a, um, like a, uh, I have like a, a two page review of it. I read that one, but yeah, I, I know about it. Um, and, yeah. and I'm a, yeah. I make my bed. So yeah, it's good. Yeah. Though. yeah. Well, you know, and that's, and that's something like that, that that's, that's so silly. But when you stop and think about it, his, his point is the Admiral's point is that, you know, you've got to take care of the little things, you right. know, you, 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 you have to make sure everything in your life's taken care of. But, um, uh, but I, I have, uh, you know, I, I do, I, I listen to a lot of, uh, uh, spiritually motivated type things, uh, you know, when I'm on the road and, and, uh, you know, just try to try to pour as much positive, uh, yeah. you know, in, into my life as I can. But, uh, I listen to a lot of praise music and, uh, that kind of fires me up a lot too. Yep. Yep. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, I just try to try to be the best person I can be every day and, and, and try to find new resources all the time to, you know, to help me keep, keep my attitude good and keep, keep everything in the right perspective. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, hey, actually before, you know what, before we go into rapid fire, are you willing to tell us who's the best Texas football player ever in college or not? The best, fo- the best, uh, <laughs> or who went to tech. Let's just, let's just go to the Texas okay. Longhorns. I, I, I got, I got, I got a, my man Earl Campbell. Is it? Okay. I mean, Earl, his senior year was 1977. And I was, I was in high school and I went to every game Earl's senior year. And, uh, he was, uh, unbelievable, wow. unbelievable. Maybe it was just a point in my life where yeah, right. I was impacted, you know, the most, but I would have a hard time finding, uh, thinking uh, anybody that had more speed, power, mm-hmm. uh, everything than, than, than Earl Campbell. And what a great guy. I, I get to visit with Earl sometimes. Uh, and, He's, he's a great guy. Of course, you know, you got to throw Ricky Williams, uh, yeah. you know, in there too. Uh, I don't know that anybody had more of an impact on the team than Vince Young. Yeah, right. Uh, what a great, uh, you know, what a great career to and watch him uh, win the national championship. And and a guy who the moment never got bigger than him, you know. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I would say those three guys uh, yeah, would good. be the top three in, in – you know, in, in my lifetime, I'm yeah. sure there were some great players before I was aware of what's going on before I was even around, but those well, three are tops. I, I don't want to make you feel old coach, but I was born in 77. So I didn't get to see any of Cam <laughs> there, but, <laughs> um, well, well, hey, he was a man. We're, we're going to go into rapid fire here. If you need to be a little bit longer, go ahead. Three pointers. So I don't know what your jump shots like these days, but uh, we'll give you a chance here to knock down three shots. So number one, if people could learn one thing from this talk, if you wanted them to just grab hold of one thing, what would you want that one thing to be? I would say, uh, mm, that's, that's, that's a good question. So many things flood my mind when you say, when you say that, because I feel so, uh, I feel so strongly about, um, a lot of different things, but, but the one thing, uh, I think is, is just to always make sure that, that, uh, you're, that you're being the best person you can be, you know, in the moment and never stop growing, never stop growing. Uh, you know, when you get to the point, uh, where a, a lot, a lot of people, I know, I know this, this is a, a three pointer, but I got a timeout right here, okay. but when, you know, when, when, when you get to the point where you're just kind of done with stuff and you don't want to, you know, our pride takes over. And when you get to the point where you can't say, I'm sorry, or you can't apologize or admit when you do something wrong, then uh, that that's very frustrating to me. And so um, I, I think the most important thing to me is staying, staying humble and always trying to uh, look at yourself in the mirror and change the things that need to be changed and, and just be honest with yourself and others. Good, good. Second one, if you could have come over here today behind the mic and asked Bob Shipley a question, what question would have you asked him that I did not ask today? Uh you covered it pretty good, Kev. I'll tell you. Uh, um, man, I don't know. I, I think you covered you, you covered it good. I, yeah. I can't think that, that's a that's it's, a tough one. I've never. Yeah, it gets a lot of people. It's a good one. Yeah, it, it is a really good one. Uh, I I guess maybe. Uh, Yeah, I, I don't know, man. I was going to say, well, you know, what, what, what's, what was your childhood like growing up, you know, okay. and all that stuff. And, 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 and every, everybody's is a little bit different. My father was a minister. And so, um, 
it, it affected me different than it does a lot of ministers, kids, you know, preachers, kids, you hear about that. Uh, I was just, I, I, I my, we, we grew up in a small town and I just, I never wanted to do anything that to cause my, my father embarrassment or hurt yeah. his calling, you know? In other words, it's, it's, it's almost the same attitude I had when I was coaching my kids. Okay. Here, this man is trying to encourage us to live a certain way and let yet his son is a heathen running around town, you know, uh, doing all kinds of crazy stuff. He can't even get his own family to, to yeah. be right. So I never wanted to bring any reproach upon him or his work or his name or anything like that. And I think the same thing with my kids, my kids had a hard time. Uh, they didn't probably enjoy being a coach's kid as much as I enjoyed coaching them mm. because if there was ever anything going on and they were involved and in, I was going to call them and them only out and, uh, made sure everybody you know knew that I wasn't uh you know playing playing favorites with them but right. anyway I think the way I grew up is it w- was was a good it was a tough life my father was not my father was raised uh his mother died when he was 12 and he was raised by an alcoholic father who wound up going to prison and so he and his three brothers are uh, have were amazing men there's only one left but uh he didn't know how to be a dad because he didn't have right. a dad his dad mm-hmm. was you know beat him up and was an alcoholic and abusive and um, so he just did the best he could and he didn't right. do everything right. And I didn't do everything right, but I've always had a lot of passion and, 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 and empathy for that because, uh, you know, we're all raised, we're all raised different ways. And it's, yep. it's, it's, it's amazing. The little things that we do in life and we respond to things in life because of how we were raised. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. So finally, the last one would be um, good stuff is the name of this. Uh, I know you've, I know you've given us a ton of that already, but is there anything else you feel is appropriate that you could give in closing? That's good stuff. Ah, man, that's just that. That's another, (laughs) I wish I would have had these questions before we went on air. So I could have thought about them, but I guess you don't ever know when you're going to have to pull up and hit a three to win the game. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, I just, I just think that, um, you know, life life is so much uh, sweeter and so much more fulfilling when you're a giver and not a taker. You know, and and so just as 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 a coach, that's the only thing I know. I don't know much about anything other than just coaching. But you know, you know as well as I do, Kevin. When you're a coach, you got to be a psychologist. You got to be a sure. counselor. You've got to be a judge, jury. You you know, there's so many things that are that that fall on us, and. Um, you know, I, I I just, you know, coaches impact lives. And I just want to encourage, you know, the guys out there and girls out there that are coaching to to never forget why you got in this business. Yeah, that's why, good. What was it that motivated you? Most of us would say, because I want to make a difference in kids' lives. I, I would hope that. And if not, why not? You know, it was it personal. Re- I mean, you know, um, prideful reasons uh, for personal gain probably wasn't you want to make you want to make a difference in a kid's life probably like a coach made in yours that's right and so uh stay grounded with that and and, and always remember that um people are looking up to you and watch you and you're an impact in lives and i always tell my coaches this you'll never be the coach you can be until your own child comes home one day with a tear rolling down her cheek because something mean or or distasteful that a coach said to him and so uh you know kids kids uh imp- are impacted by what we say and how we treat them and how we make them feel and so never forget the power that you have as a coach to influence lives that's great thank you so much well hey where can our listeners connect to you online can you let them know about twitter or anywhere else yeah i, I think my twitter is at robert shipley too i think uh yeah that's right and yeah and then uh i mean you know i'm on facebook i don't do much on that but uh and then, you know, if anybody wants to come down and buy the Texas Dream, we're at ShipleyRanches.com, you know, yeah. uh, Jordan and Jackson and myself, it's just the, the, the three musketeers. And uh, we're set on the Texas Dream, you know, down here. And it's it's a it's it's a hot market right now in Texas for sure. But but anyway, yeah, I'd love to interact with anybody on, on Twitter. I, I, I follow back uh, almost everybody. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of look at their Twitter just to make sure that they're not, you know, putting inappropriate things out there right. before I give them a follow, but I, I follow every coach back every time. So yeah. would love to interact with anybody that would like to, you know, chat a little more about some things. 
Good, good. Well, yeah, I've been on the ranch's website. You got some nice properties down there. And coach, I just, Hey, I just want to thank you for your time today. Um, you know, I also, I also want to thank you for all you've done. I know you've had a great deal of impact as a coach and throughout all those years and, and, and just that you're continuing to do it, whether it be, you know, like we talked about in social media, uh, or wherever it's at, I, I got a great deal of respect for it once again. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much for being with us today. I know this will add some value to people's lives. Well, thanks, Kevin. I appreciate what you do. And uh, it's it's not always easy. You got to sometimes uh, we had to reschedule because because I was I was out and about yesterday and got stuck. But anyway, thanks for what you do and the impact uh, that uh, the good stuff has on so many lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, hey, thanks again for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate it. As always, you can follow everything on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. And until next time, good stuff.